of what plants were grown there for the enslaved people. And we've also put um, in the, any, any plant that was mentioned by travelers in the 18th century. So they mentioned simlin squash, uh, okra. Uh, our grains are uh, millet and sorghum. So our sorghum hasn't tasseled yet to have the grain. Uh, there's cowpeas growing up the, um, up the stalk. So that's a technique where everything's planted on a hill and then the, the sorghum is the, what holds the uh, cowpeas up and then the cowpeas have something to, to grab onto so you don't have to build any kind of structure. They're not given a lot of room. These gardens are very small. Uh, the, the soil sometimes is not very, very good. It's used up land or it's behind their quarters out on a plantation. So these are people who are after a long day in the field are tending their gardens we think probably at night and also by moonlight. So these torches that you see in the garden, those are pine, dead pine, and when they're fired up, the, the pitch catches, and that becomes a source of light at nighttime. You think of that. You have toiled for the day for somebody else, and you don't have enough time to do something for yourself. So they're, they're smart. They're common sense intelligent. They burn wood so they know where the pine trees are out there in the forest, and they know everywhere that there's a, a branch on a tree, there's a knotty resinous pitch, and they know how to get those knots, bring those stakes to the ground here, poke them in the ground, put them in a fire, and they can work out here in their gardens anytime they need to, to do what they need to do. One of the important things in a garden such as this is enslaved people installed objects into their garden which had symbolic meaning and religious belief to them. The thing about the power items, objects, is to let people know that no matter how we look at history, how we look at culture, how we look at people, people come here with their culture intact. They come here, as we can say, often empty-handed, but people don't come here empty-headed. So they bring their beliefs what help them to become I'm Teal Brooks. I'm a journeyman historic gardener here at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and today I'm joined by Robert Watson and Fallon Burner. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about three different garden projects that were taking place at the historic garden site um, this year and last year. Um, the site is showing primarily uh, what you would have found behind a wealthier home in town, um, something that is showing the trade of gardening, but we wanted to represent some other styles of garden um, that would have been here in Virginia. So we have our Sankofa Heritage Garden, as well as an American Indian um, food planting. Um, but I'll let Robert introduce himself. Thank you, Teal. Um, I'm Robert Watson, Jr., um, museum interpreter, but I've had a, a great season working in the uh, primary garden at Williamsburg and helping to grow the Sankofa garden here. It's been incredible. And I'm Fallon Berner. I am the assistant research historian for Colonial Williamsburg, focusing mainly on indigenous histories. And right now we just want to show you all some footage of our American Indian farming plot and how we did the planting and some background on that. Hi, I'm Fallon Berner. I'm the assistant research historian at Colonial Williamsburg, focusing on indigenous histories. I'm out here today in our historic garden on Duke of Gloucester Street in the American Indian gardening plot. In the 18th century, these farms would have been much larger. We have an account even from the 17th century where it talked about these farming plots with three sisters agriculture being 100 acres or more. In the 18th century, Henry Timberlake mentions walking through these farms for an hour or more before reaching the other side. The Three Sisters crops are corn, beans, and squash. And that name comes from a lot of the Eastern Woodlands communities that have their own origin stories around these three crops because of their importance in the communities. This year we grew Tudelo strawberry corn, scarlet runner beans, and maycock squash. 
These three crops together are kind of magical because with corn, beans, and squash, you could get enough nutritional content to have the protein and energy you need to last you for most of the year. You probably want some other things in there like fish and, and deer meat to keep you happy and healthy, but technically you could survive for a long time on just these three things. While a lot of Eastern Woodland communities call this the Three Sisters, and that comes from their origin stories, uh, the Saponi here actually have a story about corn being the woman and bean being the man, so kind of like a husband and wife scenario. Um, so one of the things that we tried was to stagger the planting this year because we have records that state different timings of planting throughout the eastern woodlands and even in Virginia. Was corn planted first? Were beans planted first? Were all three crops planted together? So we did a little experiment and in some of the mounds we planted all three together at the same time and in the other mounds we planted the corn first without the beans and then the beans afterwards. And actually the ones where all three were planted together turned out better, they fared better. Why is this? Because these three crops need each other. They support each other in ways that ensure that they're successful throughout the season, that they're the most vital, um, the most nutritious. The corn shoots up first, the bean's gonna climb that corn and support that corn as the wind is blowing it around. And then squash comes in to cover the ground, locking the moisture in and helping to keep down weeds. Um, the beans are nitrogen fixing as well to the soil. So we did think it was kind of funny that, that the crop that we planted where the corn was first without the beans didn't fare as well. It was almost as if the wife wasn't doing so well without her husband. We have other indigenous crops in this plot as well. This year we're growing sunflowers, which are used for pest control, but also they're edible, right? We're gonna eat those seeds. Uh, we have prickly pear cactus and we also have muscadine grapes. Next year, we plan on growing this garden again, probably also with corn, beans, and squash, but we may experiment with different varieties of corn, bean, and squash and try out some new indigenous Virginia plants. So stay tuned, stick around, check us out next year, see what we've got going on and come back and see us. So how do we know what we know? In other words, what kind of evidence have we found that lets us know what these people were planting and, and how they were planting it and who was planting it? Um, so we obviously have written documentation, uh, some from the 17th century, but also from the 18th century. Robert Beverly writes about agriculture. Um, and we have visual sources. Um, there's this great set of paintings by John White uh, from the Roanoke colony in the late 16th century that then Theodore de Bry turned into engravings, and those are the images that you saw on uh, my previous video. Um, and in addition to that, we have archaeology, right? So um, they do a lot of excavations or digs here at the historic site and at the college. And about 10 years ago, they dug the, Braff or, sorry, the Wren Building's south yard and what they found there were four beans and lots and lots of pieces of corn, about 98 bits of corn. And the era that they dated these two was the first quarter of the 18th century, so around the time that the Wren building had actually burned down and was being rebuilt. At this point in time, uh, the Wren housed the kitchen for the entire college, and so these would have been bits of food, uh, as part of the food process, food making, um, that probably got discarded. And then we also had over at the Brafferton these cucurbit rinds. And now cucurbit is just the fancy scientific name. It's the family that squash is in. So these are basically squash rinds. Um, and what I like is that these came from the 19th century. So here we have an 18th century and then a 19th century example of um, these American Indian crops still being eaten, and of course we still eat them today. And then at Weatherburn's Tavern, uh, we found some squash seeds that actually look surprisingly just like a squash seed you would find today, uh, just a little bit fossilized maybe, <laughs> but those look the most recognizable out of all those bits. Yeah, and for you know the English gentleman's garden, we actually have quite a bit of written information um, surviving. We have journals, we have inventories, seed lists, um, and another source is published garden books kind of aimed at hobby gardeners at the time, uh, many of which were published in England, uh, but even here in town, John Randolph, for example, pens a garden treatise um, that describes you know how and when to plant things and also lists you know what's being planted. Um, which gives us some clues as to what we should include in our garden when we plant it today. Um, and archaeology uh, is also important. There's been numerous sites around town where they've been able to um, find remains of formal gardens. And currently uh, at Colonial Williamsburg, the 
uh, John Custis IV site is being dug, and we are very excited for that. He was a very prominent and well-known gardener in the early 18th century, um, and they have found what they believe to be some of the layout um, and beginnings of his uh, garden at his house. And then also as part of that process, they're looking for seed remains. Um, there, I think we have some images of the, the machines on site um, that are doing that. They're also going to be testing for pollen. So hopefully we get a really interesting picture of some of the plants um, that he was growing, which will add to um, some of the uh, letters that we have that survive between him and a botanist in England, where they're kind of writing back and forth about their gardens. Mm -hmm. And much of the information when it comes to free and enslaved people, uh, think of accounts like uh, Washington's accounts between his managers and his enslaved on what they're raising, what they're growing, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's uh, farm book. And what I always say to people is, if it's in the master's gardens, it's also going to be in free and enslaved people's gardens too. Sankofa. We're growing a Sankofa garden. Sankofa is a, a word that means looking forward, but always kind of knowing where you've come from. It's uh, from Ghana. And what we're trying to do is make people aware that these people may have come here empty-handed, but they were not empty-headed. They always could go back and grab that knowledge to survive. Let's see the video. Welcome to the Sankofa Heritage Garden, which can be found within the Colonial Garden here in Williamsburg, across from the Bruton Parish Church. So the plants that we have decided to put in the Sankofa Heritage Garden this year are plants that we know come from the Rich Neck Plantation site, which is about two and a half, three miles from here. Archaeologists unearthed some of the subfloor pits and found seeds and evidence pollen of what plants were grown there for the enslaved people. And we've also put um, in the any, any plant that was mentioned by travelers in the 18th century. So they mentioned simlin squash, uh, okra. Uh, our grains are uh, millet and sorghum. So our sorghum hasn't tasseled yet to have the grain. Uh, there's cowpeas growing up the um, up the stalk so that's a technique where everything's planted on a hill and then the the sorghum is the what holds the uh, cow peas up and then the cow peas have something to to grab onto so you don't have to build any kind of structure they're not given a lot of room these gardens are very small uh, the, the soil sometimes is not very very good it's used up land or it's behind their quarters out on a plantation. So these are people who are after a long day in the field are tending their gardens we think probably at night and also by moonlight. So these torches that you see in the garden those are pine, dead pine and when they're fired up the the pitch catches and that becomes a source of light at night time. You think of that. You have toiled for the day for somebody else and you don't have enough time to do something for yourself. So they're, they're smart, they're common sense intelligent. They burn wood so they know where the pine trees are out there in the forest and they know everywhere that there's a, a branch on a tree, there's a knotty resinous pitch and they know how to get those knots, bring those stakes to the ground here, poke them in the ground, put them in a fire and they can work out here in their gardens anytime they need to, to do what they need to do. One of the important things in a garden such as this is enslaved people installed objects into their garden which had symbolic meaning and religious belief to them. The thing about the power items, objects, is to let people know that no matter how we look at history, how we look at culture, how we look at people, people come here with their culture intact. They come here, as we can say, often empty-handed but people don't come here empty headed. So they bring their beliefs, what helped them to become their own selves, what kept them strong, what, what they could always hold on to 
no matter what was happening in their world, these things would guide them and keep them people all their lives. That's rich. Bones are thought to be speaking of the ancestors and they are asking their ancestors to please protect the food and protect the gardeners uh, so that they may harvest the food and live a healthier and better life. Uh, the other things in there are elements of nature. So we have a feather for air, shell for water, and a piece of iron that speaks of fire. So elements of nature which are important to their culture. Uh, the gourd hanging upside down like that, that is a, uh, a house of a good spirit. If something evil comes along, it grabs that evil, pushes it down into the gourd so it does not do harm to the food nor the people in the garden. To stand in a garden like this and to know that we are growing food that sustained these people, even if it was the worst little plot of dirt, a piece of ground like this that they could put everything in to feed themselves, to have gatherings with their family after a long day of laboring for somebody else. These little plots of ground, it meant the world to them. And that's why these gardens are important in what we're teaching at Williamsburg. Hey, I hope you all enjoy that video. Now, when I do this kind of work, we all do this kind of work. We always get asked, who's doing this work? So a lot of times these are gentlemen and gentle ladies gardens, but we know it was a lot of times the enslaved who was doing it. And in all my years, I had always heard of James, the gardener who worked out at Carter's Grove, by, is owned by Carter Burrow. But then we started looking and there were other enslaved gardeners. Ellick, uh, a gardener, and Joseph uh, was a gardener to Joseph Prentice. Uh, Lancaster, enslaved gardener at the governor's palace, owned by Governor Falk here and later owned by gardener tavern keeper Christopher Askew. Bacchus, Will, Jack, Tom, all enslaved gardeners at the palace working under gardener, English gardener James Simpson, owned by Governor Botetot. Jack, enslaved gardener owned by William Atkinson. See, these are people who are doing the same stuff that I'm doing today, enjoying it, you know, in my life. I wonder what it was like for them. Yeah. And in terms of American Indian uh, farming plots here in Senecomico or Virginia, indigenous societies uh, are largely, um, you know, the agriculture is run by women, just like the women also kind of own the houses. Um, so there would have maybe in some archaeological digs we see like a farming plot that's right beside the woman's house that she would have managed. But we also know from records that the werewants or the chief would have had his own large uh, village plot that everybody worked on together. And so it's just a sort of policy of, of take what you need when you need it. Um, but a lot of the farming work was being done by women. And the men would help out maybe at the beginning of the planting season to clear the field initially. Um, but the rest of the year, other than the women doing the work, the uh, children who were staying with the women might have done some of the smaller tasks on the side. And we have this cool source from the Roanoke colony that talks about children sort of acting as scarecrows in the field uh, to keep away pests. And then, of course, any of the elderly men uh, who were beyond uh, the age or who had retired from hunting or fighting would have helped out with some of those tasks as well. And for the, you know, the English colonists garden, I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that, you know, the, from the trade perspective, it's actually almost entirely men um, who are formerly part of the gardening trade, um, which is not to say that women aren't working in those gardens as well, both, you know, enslaved women um, and sometimes women paid hourly. Um, and also it's worth keeping in mind, you know, though it has some of the same plants and planting techniques, um, the garden that we're showing is a very small segment of the population and most Virginians are living very rurally at the time. They're on farms and plantations and they're also going to have to grow for subsistence um, and that's going to look really different um, from what we're, we're showing here in town. Um, but we've got a video prepared to kind of talk a little bit about the historic garden trade and then after the video we will be happy to take questions from the audience as well. Hi, my name is Mark and I'm here with Teal and we're gardeners here in the historical garden in Colonial Williamsburg. Gardening in the 18th century was a hobby for people of means. It was an opportunity for gentlemen to show off their wealth, their taste and their education, 
all in plant form. Even having a large garden in town shows that you have a lot of money. You don't need to build a rental property or a shop. Instead, you can give over your property to plants. And it's a mixed planting. You have practical vegetables that you want to have on your table when they're in season. Turnips, beets, carrots, beans, peas, right next to decorative plants. Calendula, uh, brown-eyed Susan, um, passion flower. The important thing was this was your private space, a backyard, and you wanted it to be as impressive as possible when you invited guests in. Full of life, full of greenery, absolutely beautiful. But botany and gardening also go hand in hand in the 18th century. It wouldn't be unusual to have exotic plants, scientific specimens mixed in the garden as well. Yeah, when the English are first coming to Virginia, they bring uh, both the vegetables and flowers that they're used to growing back in England, uh, but they're very quick to incorporate plants that they find growing with the American Indians for food. Uh, and they also take a great interest in native wildflowers, um, things like the brown-eyed Susan, trees like magnolia, dogwood, something like a sunflower, um, which they're using ornamentally in gardens and sending specimens of back to botanical gardens in Europe, um, things that they're sharing uh, with their contemporaries there. Um, and then at this point, they're also searching out plants from the rest of the world. I mean, the further away something comes from, the more exotic, the more exciting. Um, something like the castor bean you can see behind us coming from Africa uh, would be grown just for its exotic beauty. Um, and another way that you're showing off, or another thing that you're showing off in the time period with a garden like this, is that you have the labor um, to keep this garden. Some gardeners do consider this a hobby. They might dabble in gardening, uh, but the other source for that would be professional gardeners. Um, the gardening as a trade in England is very developed at the time. Some gardeners that are working here at the Governor's Palace, for example, have actually been trained in England and Scotland before coming here. Uh, and in Virginia and the rest of the colonies, another source of that labor is going to be the enslaved, some of whom become very skilled gardeners and are actually hired out around town. Um, today, uh, we're part of the Department of Historic Trade, so we're actually still using historic tools and techniques to maintain these gardens. Um, and in the varieties we choose, we're using heirlooms, um, as old a variety as we, as we can get. And actually this season, we're pretty excited. We've been doing some seed saving projects to try to keep some of those varieties. Um, in particular this year, we've been trying to save seeds from a pole bean and a lima bean. Um, we're trying to save some seeds from carrots. That's a project yeah. we've got um, coming up this winter. Um, but we're gardening year-round out here, so next time you're in town, please stop by and see us. So now that you've heard a little bit about all three of the garden projects, um, we figured we would take some questions. Thanks, Teal. This is Brody Adams. I am uh, one of the producers here for Trades Tuesday, and I will be giving voice to the audience questions this afternoon. Uh, one of our first questions we have, um, Fallon, you mentioned a little bit in your video about how the gardening that we see in the American Indian plot here in Colonial Williamsburg uh, would be more likely to be seen on a farm in the 18th century. So what is the difference really between farming and gardening? Yeah, so um, the important thing to remember here is that in modern times we have space constraints <laughs> and things just happen organically uh, where we can. Um, so the garden actually offered to host um, an American Indian uh, plot, but really the scale at which um, the corn, beans, and squash agriculture would have been grown for indigenous societies, we would call that farming or agriculture. Um, it's a food crop. It's grown on a very large scale. Uh, like I said in the video, you have a, a European account. Uh, Henry Timberlake says you can just walk through the, the fields for a really long time. So to me, that's really the biggest difference. I don't know if teal is another definition difference she'd want to parse out. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, for our Colonial Williamsburg, we actually have a whole separate trade, um, which is farming. Um, so handling things that are grown, you know, for, for sale in the international market at the time. Um, and on those farms, you will see people keeping, you know, provision gardens, maybe even a couple acres um, to feed themselves. Uh, but what we show in town, I mean, yeah, the scale of it is completely different. And the gardens, you know, you may get some food out of, but they're really not for um, subsistence. And the American Indian plot really would have been things grown for trade as well. Like you're saying, it, they're trading it mostly to Europeans in exchange for other goods. Yes, yes, y'all got it. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Karen on Facebook. Uh, she really likes learning about weed control. Do you have any uh, information about how that was done? Squash. 
Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of, of course, you know, there are no herbicides at the time, so a lot of the gardening that, you know, all of these cultures are engaged in, we would today consider organic gardening, um, but that, you know, means a huge increase in labor. Um, so for, you know, the site that we manage, I mean, it's all hand weeding. I mean, there's very few instances of, you know, mulch applied, you know, to keep weeds down. Um, it's, it's people doing that work, um, but the, the squash is a great example um, of kind of a different approach. Yeah, because the squash has gigantic leaves and it stays low to the ground. So not only does it help keep the moisture in, but it helps keep weeds away from having the space to grow and do their own thing too. And both the Sankofa Garden and the American Indian Garden have, or prominently featuring squash for that reason. That's right. Just like you all saw in the videos, whether these folks had the time to do it during the day or had to work in their gardens at night, they still had to get out there and pick those bugs and worms off of their food. So Robert, that brings us into uh, another great question. How did they deal with pest control back then? Hmm. I think today as people, we're a little bit too uh, lenient with all the little uh, animal life that's around. We, we grow food for them to eat. In the times that you know we represent, Anything that ate your food, you ate them. I don't care if it was a squirrel or rabbit or whatever. Uh, you made a meal out of them. So uh, I think we need to go back to some of that. And in indigenous farms, they would have hung uh, a gourd, an empty gourd above the um, crops to hopefully welcome in the nests of purple martins. And what's neat about the purple martins is not only are they probably gonna eat some of your pests, but they're very territorial and they're gonna defend their, their area. And so they're gonna probably keep out squirrels and other smaller pests uh, just from being defensive of their own nest area. Yeah, and I think 18th century uh, professional gardeners also would have been a lot less tolerant of rabbits and other little critters, which today is kind of, you know, a complication for us, and we, we do deal with those. And for insect pests, I mean, again, it's a lot of labor. Um, you know, we just kind of learn when a pest is a problem and make it part of our morning routine to, you know, flip over the leaves of that plant, look for the eggs, look for the bugs, and, and remove them manually. There's a few recipes that float around for um, pesticide, things made from um, like a tobacco leaf tea, but that doesn't seem to be in common practice. It really is, is going to be mostly just hand control. All right, great, thank you. So we have a lot of questions. People are really uh, excited about the different plants that we see in some of the different gardens. Um, but Marty in particular was surprised that there was cactus in the gardens. Can you all tell us a little bit about the cactus that we see there? It, uh, it elicits a lot of questions on a daily basis um, in the garden, but uh, cactus, prickly pear cactus is a native across much of the United States. Um, and you know, it's place in you know, the, our English garden, it's there as a botanical specimen, um, but it is also a food source. Yeah, I mean, Teal said it, it's, it's an indigenous plant here. And so it would have been something you would have seen before the English arrived. Um. All right, and uh, Billy was wondering, can we get maybe not a, a full list of every plant that we have in the garden? I know that would, that would probably take us the rest of the time we have for today, but um, can you just name some of your favorite plants that we have in these three garden plots? For me, the Sankofa garden, the patty pan squash, the peanuts. Um, I haven't tried the millet yet. Um, I think those are, those are mine. I always kind of go for the, the citrus just because it's such a out there example of something, you know, completely um, exotic that requires so much labor and energy just to keep it in the garden. It's completely impractical. So it really does show, um, you know, just the extravagance of, of what's going on in these gardens. But it's been really fun just over the last um, two years to, to in introduce new things to our garden that we know are being grown and are part of horticulture here um, in Virginia, like all of the, the West African plants in the Sankofa garden and getting to look at older varieties from the American Indian food. Mm. Mm. Yeah, out of everything that we had in the garden or we have in the garden currently, uh, the most recent thing I've eaten is the muscadine grapes actually, which are another mm. indigenous mm. Virginia plant. We don't really talk about it uh, in the American Indian plot video, but you see a brief clip of it uh, with Chris's hand gesturing to it. So those are pretty good. You'll see, you'll see them growing around. Um, they can be tart, um, but some of them can be sweeter as well, just depending. Yeah. And I've got one more that I don't want to leave out. Um, I love okra. Okra's in that uh, Sankofa garden. 
You can roast it, grill it, fry it, stew it, okra all the time, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're talking about favorites, um, Aaron would like to know, what is, uh, what's your favorite part about gardening? I mean, playing in the dirt is fun. <laughs> Doing it barefoot is, is probably my preference. <laughs> I really like how everything is kind of constantly, you know, changing. Just when you're getting bored of, you know, seeing one thing or doing one activity, um, you know, it's time to switch to something else. It's time to plant new plants. The, the weather is going to change to something different. So you never really get stuck um, doing one thing for very long. Yeah, for me, it's knowing that you got to understand dirt. You got to make sure that you put what is needed for to make this dirt grow the food that you want. And the, the joy of knowing you're putting this little tiny seed in the ground and you're going to get this huge squash from it or pumpkin. Uh, and then comes the work. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Leslie who wants to know, are there any plants we know that were grown in the 18th century that we don't have anymore that have gone extinct or are perhaps in danger? There's definitely things that we grow less of, um, you know, and certainly varieties we have lost. Um, you know, the just sheer number of varieties, even of ornamental flowers or something listed in the 18th century, um, you can't find that many in seed catalogs today. Um, foods, you know, we see named and described varieties that we've looked and you can't really find um, examples of. Um, but you know, there's things that are less common, like skirret. Most people haven't heard of skirret. It's a root vegetable, which kind of has like long finger shaped roots. Doesn't really survive, you know, mechanized harvest. So probably not something you're gonna see farmed on a big scale. Um, but if you look in, you know, historic seed catalogs, that's one you can still track down. So I like eating at the tavern. Sometimes I eat things that I'd never <laughs> would have thought to eat, but they taste really good. And, and I know that the tavern sometimes get food from, that we grow on site, so. Great. Uh, sort of leading into another question there, where do we get our seeds from that we grow here in Colonial Williamsburg? Uh, a lot of different sources. Um, you know, some of them we do source from small seed companies that still specialize in heirloom seeds. Um, for example, that we were happy to get a lot of seeds from um, a company called True Love in Philadelphia that specialized in some West African seeds. So when we were putting together um, the Sankofa project. Um, a lot of them have been gifts um, that people have given us. Uh, Michael Twitty, the food historian, actually um, was able to give us a number of seeds that helped start the Sankofa Garden Project. Um, you know, the seeds that were in the American Indian Garden Project came from, um, you know, I think local community. So yeah, it's one of our interpreters that came actually from uh, his community. It's Tutelo Strawberry Corn. So in that way, seeds are almost like their own archive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a part of the heritage, too, of people and their families because, you know, they pass the seeds down from one generation to the next. That's what it's all about. All right. Uh, we got a question from YouTube. Invader54 would like to know, um, seems like uh, the Sankofa Garden and the American Indian Garden are both very important uh, things to talk about here in Colonial Williamsburg. Is there any plan to make those more of a standalone interpretive site or is it, are they both going to continue being part of the historic gardens? It's a good question. Um, I think just based on where we have, you know, garden resources right now um, and as we've been, you know, as gardeners ourselves interested in doing some of the research and learning about those, it's made sense to kind of put them all together. But um, certainly there's potential for those to be demonstrated with other aspects of 18th century life. Yeah. Um, yeah and if you have the, the people and the time, it'd be great to have more of representation of gardens all over Williamsburg. And not only to show, you know, enslaved and free, but common folks uh, gardens so they could learn about how everybody's growing food. Okay, thank you. Um, so what was the benefit of planting certain crops together? So we saw 
uh, actually some similarities between the American Indian planting methods and the uh, planting methods used in the Sankofa Heritage Garden with, you know, sort of a tall crop uh, with beans and, you know, then squash kind of all planted together in tandem. What, what was the benefit to that? So fancy academic language for this would be intercropping versus monocropping, right? So the English at this period of time are really fans of monocropping, of keeping one crop per plot, um, really organized rows. Whereas intercropping um, is what our garden's doing and what the Sankofa garden's doing, where you plant multiple things together in the same hill or mound uh, so that they can work together and support each other. Um, and you actually get more food per acre with intercropping, so that's one of the benefits. But also, um, as our producer Brody was saying, um, you know, the corn, an, an example in the uh, American Indian plot, the corn shoots up um, and gives the beans something to climb because the beans need to find the light and then they can cling to that. And I've also heard that the beans help support, you know, that structure in the wind for the corn as well. And then you have the squash on the ground. Um, keeping down weeds and keeping the moisture in um, and the beans as well below the surface are doing an extra job uh, silently keeping nitrogen in the soil because um, a lot of times you can use up a lot of nitrogen in agriculture that's often why in monocropping you have to move from one thing to the next so quickly but the beans help uh, draw that back into the soil. Everything Fallon said I say the same. Awesome. Yeah, and in, you know, I mean, the English are certainly aware of, you know, needing to regenerate soil and in back in England where there's, you know, scarce amounts of land for agriculture, they figured out, you know, crop rotation um, that does some of that same thing, like clover, you know, might put back nitrogen into the ground, um, but they're not really using it yet when they get here. They're very interested in growing stuff to make money, to export it. Um, and even when they are doing that, it's more on like a year after year basis mm -hmm. rather than interplanting in the same um, season. Yeah, yeah. And I also got to say, you know, it, it goes back to the, the common sense and the ingenuity of people who've been doing this for hundreds of years. They, their parents did it, their grandparents did it. They know this kind of work like the back of their hand. All right, great. Um, we have a question from Alexandra who wants to know, you know, it's the end of September now, sort of harvest season. So what is being harvested right now from the different gardens? Well, we recently pulled out the corn, the beans, the squash. <laughs> yeah, I think from, from the American Indian plot, I mean, it's pretty much right now all harvested mm -hmm. um, and going to be stashed away. Um, Sankofa is still producing. Yeah, we got some okra, uh, the millet yet to be uh, harvested. Um, peppers, um, always got some um, basil, um, so there's still a few things going strong. Sweet potatoes, Sweet both potatoes, in the, peanuts, the English pot, yeah. Peanuts yet to be harvested. But that's, green, greens have gone in the ground, right. so we'll be, we'll be able to harvest things like collards and kale, um, you know, as the season cools down, those will be ready to go. That's right, your cold weather plants. So were there different preferences for ripeness, you know, different uh, times for harvesting? You might harvest some things earlier, some things later. Yeah, I can speak to this. Corn uh, is a big, a big one that's, it gets staggered planting. So they'll do an earlier planting of corn and they might harvest that in May. Uh, some may, might call that green corn. It's juicier. You're going to make different kinds of recipes with it. Uh, you're going to want to eat it right away. Um, and then there's going to be later harvesting throughout the summer of corn that you planted later. So there's all this staggering, um, kind of hedging your bets, right? It's smart. But then also the stuff that you're harvesting later in the season, the, what you don't eat immediately in that, you know, harvest feast, you're storing for the winter. You're probably drying and turning into corn, uh, into flour and things like that uh, for use all the way through until next spring when things start growing again. Yeah, I mean, and in the, you know, the colonial kind of more gentry garden, um, it really is going to be a luxury to have perishable stuff um, all, all season. So, I mean, mm -hmm. they're not as focused on growing things to store down to survive the winter. We're putting a lot of money and energy into things like individual glass covers, you know, so that you might have a, a salad of fresh lettuce in the middle of February, um, which is not something that most people um, will experience in Virginia in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So, Teal, you were just talking about these different uh, globes and things that might be put over crops to, to make it a little easier to grow them in the cooler months. 
Um, was greenhousing something that was done in the 18th century? Yes, um, definitely only in the scale of, you know, people keeping these kind of pleasure and hobby gardens. Um, it's going to be very expensive. They, they aren't even, at this point, buildings completely made of glass. Um, it's kind of more of like a, a brick building with large glass windows on the front, sometimes called an orangery, um, which gives you an idea of what sort of plants they're putting in there. It's not your field crops. It's things like citrus, like oranges, like pineapple, cactus. So it would really be to show off um, an exotic collection of plants rather than actually um, you know, make plants that you would later put out into the field for agricultural purposes like we do with greenhouses now. All right. So it seems we have a lot of gardeners in the chat. Um, and are there any practices from the 18th century that we still use for modern gardening or that maybe any of you have taken into, uh, you know, the gardening that you might do as a hobby? I mean, I think the, the renewed interest in, you know, organic gardening um, recently, you know, everything that they're doing in the 18th century just because they don't have, you know, chemical inputs is organic. So if you're kind of looking for ways that historically have worked, um, it's certainly a good place to start. Um, and I think the other thing, too, is just, you know, people getting uh, renewed interest in historic seed varieties and preserving some of those, whether it's just something that they think is really cool or something that has, you know, some personal and family significance. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I see people being curious about other than planting in flat earth hills and rows. Uh, they're learning of this, uh, this kind of new way of gardening, which is old, but uh, people are learning and they're sharing. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Fallon here. Um, somebody wants to know, were fish really used as fertilizer? by American Indians? Okay, so Teal and I have talked a lot about this. Um, is this is a common a myth that gets dispelled. Um, so this really comes from one primary source and that is Tisquantum or Squanto uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the, or also in the early 17th century. Um, so Squanto had been kidnapped uh, and taken across the ocean you know, to England, to Scandinavia, and in Scandinavia he learned about probably using fish there, we think, and then he ended up in uh, somewhere in Canada for a while um, before he came back here. So really that one or two seasons that he was teaching the English how to plant and was putting fish on it, that's from his experience abroad. Um, there was this academic article from the 1970s where this woman uh, really pulled apart the argument um, and she said some other things like, um, right at the, the point of the season where you're planting the crops is when you're hungriest because you're running out of all the store stuff from the year before, at least in the American Indian uh, planting tradition. So why would you then, if you're able to get all those fish from the ocean, why would you not just be eating the fish? Why would you put them on the plants? Um, also just the scale of it, the amount of fish you'd have to bring in to make that actually effective. I think it's like three or four fish per hill or something like that. When you multiply that by the acres and acres that these folks were growing agricultural uh, agriculture on, like that's just prohibitive to bring that many fish in and get them to where your garden is. Like you're probably gonna, you're more likely to eat that fish than you are to just put it on your garden. And there's, there's other ways that they can get plants to grow. Um, so that's really, that's a common misconception. <laughs> if you have anything else to add? No, that, that yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Paul on Facebook wants to know, what do you all do with uh, all the vegetables that you grow? Yeah. Um, some of them do get used uh, in programming in the historic area. Um, so our historic food waste prop, uh, program, which cooks over at the governor's palace, um, gets quite a few of them. Um, occasionally, um, for some things where we have a lot of a harvest at once, we might actually be able to take it to the chefs at the Williamsburg Inn, um, and they'll actually cook it into food that's eaten. Um, so we try to make sure it all gets used somewhere. Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, trying to, especially with, you know, the additional two gardens on our site, do some more programming related um, to cooking those foods yeah. now that we've seen them grown and know that we can produce a certain amount on site. Um, this year we took all the Tudelo strawberry corn that we harvested and um, braided all of the husks together, which is something that would have traditionally been done to store it and dry it and hang it. So. Now we have another, an extra thing that we can interpret until we want to do something else with that corn. And some of, the, some of it we've saved, you know, we actually let it mature and save for seeds. So yep. we've been planting some things for a couple years based on, you know, the first seeds that we got. 
All right, we have one last question here. Uh, what projects are you all working on for next year or next season? I'd like to see the gourds get hung uh, for pest control next year so we can invite some purple martins in to nest. I want to see that happen. Continue to plant, continue to grow these gardens, continue this way of uh, showing diversity, inclusiveness. Um, we're, we're moving now and uh, we want to continue to move forward. Yeah, I mean, having both of these projects on our site has been really exciting for the past two years and is definitely probably the most exciting thing looking at going forward um, into next season, season is just to continue um, that kind of experimental archaeology of what we're doing there. All right. Well, Teal, Robert, Fallon, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, helping us learn a little bit more about the gardening projects that we have going on here in Colonial Williamsburg. Today's live stream was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. As always, this program was made possible through the, gener through the generosity of our donors. Thank you. To learn how you can contribute, please follow the links pinned to the comments below or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Do you all have any final comments for our viewers before we head off today? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance already when you're in town, definitely stop by um, the historic gar garden site and see all three of the gardens. Things will be a little bit quiet um, in the winter, but we're excited to um, you know, turn soil over and show all three of those sites again um, this coming spring.